The following is a presentation of Major League Baseball Productions. For those of us who are devout members of Red Sox Nation, 2004 was the experience of a lifetime. For these legends of the fall had reversed the fortunes of a franchise and filled us with a joy we'd never known. Red Sox fans of all the year, the Boston Red Sox are world champions. Three years later, the cast was somewhat different but the hopes were still the same. Some had experienced the fall classic. Swing and a miss, he's fucking out. Mike Lowell has delivered. Hey, World Series rookies. For others, it was their first time in the brightest lights. Goodbye! two-run homer. He has been unbelievable, Hideki Okajima. All of them would have their moments. Big Poppy adds to his October resume their chance to shine. And it's gone! Grand slam, J.D. Drew! And the Red Sox are winners! I'm a star of pain! And I lost my leg! Climbing at the top sails! I lost my leg! From all over the world, they came to play for and represent One Nation. One Nation. One Nation. The Red Sox Nation. Indivisible. Unbeatable. The legend grows for Kurt Schiller. Euclid gets him on the phone. Hey, welcome to the party. The time had come to reclaim baseball supremacy. Champagne tastes like champagne. Road or home. That's what I'm talking about. The time had come to win it all. Major League Baseball Productions presents. Oh my God. The 2007 World Series film. The 2006 season ended in disappointing fashion for the Red Sox when they failed to make the playoffs for the first time in four years. But as the 2007 campaign unfolded, it was clear this was a different team. Read all about your smoking red hot red sauce. Behind a dedication to defense. What a catch by Coco Crisp! The creation of a top-notch pitching staff. Swing and a miss, he struck it out. And some truly memorable moments. Number four in a row! Boston would return to the postseason in a manner that they hadn't done in more than a decade. The Red Sox are taking care of their business tonight at Fenway Park as they win. Now all eyes will be directed towards Camden Yards in Baltimore. It was kind of a surreal night, the way it happened. You know, we win, the Yankees are playing Baltimore. Ramirez, the 1-0 delivery. Bunting, runner coming, fair ball, and they win it! Red Sox win the division, Yankees are the wild card. And we all came out with a bunt and, you know, watching our players go crazy. It was a pretty neat moment. That was very big for us. And we can get this reign of Red Sox baseball going in the right direction to where, you know, we're the ones that are going to be the top of the American League East every year. It was the first time we won the division in, in a dozen years. So I think that the team went into postseason feeling very confident about themselves. The Angels and Boston Red Sox opening up the ALDS tonight at Fenway Park. And Boston had reason to be confident. After all, they'd beaten the Angels in six straight playoff games. And Josh Beckett had built a reputation as a big-time playoff pitcher. 19 straight set down by Beckett. Great call, fastball over the inside corner. It seems like his concentration level just zooms in in the playoffs. I mean, he's so focused. He executes his game plan almost to a T. Josh Beckett, a complete game, four hit shutout. And uh, that's why he's our ace. The Red Sox take game one, four to nothing. In game two, the Boston bullpen showed why they had the league's best ERA by not allowing a hit for almost half a game. 
tip to the Red Sox bullpen as the bullpen pitched four and one third scoreless innings. I think uh, from top to bottom, our bullpen was, was lights out. The one, two. Strike three call. Thinking fastball over the outside corner. Half pumps his fist. The bullpen's masterful work set the stage for some late game heroics. So this will set up first and second, two outs in the bottom of the ninth, and Manny Ramirez coming to the plate. Both those guys are terrific. It just made sense not to not to go after David and didn't work tonight. And a long drive to left, way back, deep into the night. Three-run walk-off home run, Manny Ramirez, and the Red Sox have won it. He's one of the greatest closers in the game, and I'm one of the best hitters in the game, and he missed his spot, and... Got good timing on the board, and that's it. The Red Sox win 6-3 on a bomb by Manny. Can you believe it? It was Manny being Manny at his big-time best. And when the series moved to Anaheim, Manny's booming bat had company. And it is back-to-back -back home runs for Ortiz and Ramirez. 2 to nothing, Red Sox. They are going to go down someday as two of the best back-to-back -back hitters, certainly in recent postseason play. And on the mound, a pretty decent playoff pitcher in Kurt Schilling. Best of five, you're up 2-0 with a chance to put, put the final nail in the coffin, or you don't do it, they get back in the series. Schilling was masterful. <laughs> Lifting his career postseason record to a sensational 9-2, the Angels were no match. Swung on and missed, he got him. He struck him out again. In that game, I thought we just did everything we had to do. We got on them early, got ahead, and uh, when we did, we never looked back. And that does it. The Red Sox sweep the Angels, and they are in the American League Championship Series. The Red Sox and the Cleveland Indians open the 2007 American League Championship Series. The two teams finished tied for the best record in baseball, but only one had the dynamic duo of Poppy and Manny. Two perfect nights at the plate. Ten plate appearances, ten times that duo reached base. That's never happened with teammates in the history of the postseason, and it seemed like it was fitting that it was those two guys. And Beckett made certain Boston would secure still another Game 1 victory. So the Red Sox win it behind the pitching of Josh Beckett and that lethal 3-4 combination of David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez. The Red Sox had plenty of swagger, so much so that in Red Sox Nation, the countdown to their coronation had begun. But perhaps that was a bit premature, and the momentum suddenly shifted Cleveland's way. The Indians take game two. Ball game! And the Indians have a two games to one lead. The Cleveland Indians are one win away from winning the American League pennant. They've won three consecutive games from the Boston Red Sox. Being down 3-1 against Cleveland was not a new scenario to us, having been through 2004. The most stunning comeback in baseball history. First team ever to win a series. Went down three games to nine. The veterans on the team didn't panic. In fact, they set a great example. We had a little team meeting after game four, and for the few guys that were here from all four, to, to make sure the guys that weren't here understood, we don't have to win three straight games. We got to go out there and win one inning at a time. We have to go out and we have to win the first inning. And when we win the first inning, we win the second. And if we go out there and try to win each and every inning, those innings will eventually turn into wins. Now every game was do or die, but Boston remained confident entering game five, and there was a very, very good reason why. Well, it doesn't hurt when you're down 3-1 and you have the best pitcher on the planet going for you in an elimination game in Beckett, and you pretty much knew he was going to come up big. True to form. Another strikeout for Beckett. Beckett was solid. Josh Beckett was brilliant. Striking out 11 and allowing the bats to explode. The Boston Red Sox have done what they needed to do tonight in desperate straits, and now there will be a Game 6 at Fenway Park. Playing Game 6 and elimination possibility, I think uh, these fans are going to be really excited. Go Red Sox! Woo! Yeah! Getting rowdy and, and staying loud probably throughout the whole game. And the team would feed off that energy. Getting back to Fenway and getting in our environment is a big advantage for us. You know, our offense just took some time to get going, and 
Once they did, there's you know, really no shot that they were going to win. Boston proceeded to load the bases in the first and drew first blood. Swing and a fly ball, center field, hit well, back goes size more to the warning track by the fence, and it's gone! Grand slam, J.D. Drew, 4-0 Boston. J.D. not only getting a two-out RBI, but getting four in one bunch. I mean, the emotion in the ballpark, you could just feel it. It was a great feeling, um, you know, more than anything, just trying to hit a ball hard up the middle. You know, luckily it ends up out of the park. J.D. Drew with his biggest hit ever as a member of the Red Sox. And the Red Sox stay alive. A 12-2 pounding of the Cleveland Indians. Big game seven at Fenway Park tonight. And it all comes down to this. One game to determine the champion of the American League. And the Red Sox put their fate in the hands of a pitcher who's the pride of two nations. And there's your right-hander, Dice K, Matt Suzaka. Well, I think the entire nation of Japan was awake and watching that game. Hussein! After four and a half, Boston three, Cleveland two. Dice K pitch in a way that gave us a chance to win. And they got that chance when perhaps the smallest of the Sox came up big. A swing and a drive out to deep left center field. Lofton is back at the wall. Goodbye! Pedroia, a two-run homer. 5-2 Red Sox. I don't even remember running on the bases, to tell you the truth. It's the biggest, biggest at bat of my life, and, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. Not bad for a guy who describes himself as 5'2", 115 pounds. He's got a little bit of that Napoleon thing going, you know. He's a little guy who's been told all his life that he can't do something, and he goes out and does it. Line drive, left center field toward the gap. Lofton can't get it. It hits on the grass. It goes to the scoreboard. Dustin Petroya clears the bases with a three-run double. And the Red Sox have broken it wide open. They lead it. 9-2. Pedroia had five RBIs in the game, and the man behind him tied an LCS record with 14 hits in the series. Wait a long drive to left. This one's gone. Way back. Off the Coke bottles. Two run five. Kevin Euclid. Euclid sent Fenway further into a frenzy. But then it's not like he hadn't done that before. Every at bat looks like life and death to Kevin Euclid. So people appreciate that passion and have gravitated as a major fan favorite in this town. And still another fan favorite would ensure that Boston's remarkable comeback was complete. Jonathan Papelbon trying to get the final out. I just wanted the game to be over with. Nerves were getting entirely too high and, and Pat did a great job and it was chaos from there. Look at a high fly ball, right center field. Coco going back, still going back to the triangle, going back. He makes a great catch in the triangle. The Red Sox have won the pennant. For the second time in four years, the Red Sox have won the American League pennant. It's amazing how these two teams have been able to come back from being eliminated. And the way they came back was just not to lose another game, just the opposite of what was seen for so many years. They showed a lot of heart because it looked like they were dead in Cleveland. The 2007 Boston Red Sox are headed to the World Series. Can you believe it? the story with the Boston Red Sox. They were down three games to one to Cleveland. They've won three straight, so they come right into this World Series hot. They're hot. What are the Colorado Rockies? Winners of 21 of their last 22. The Rockies' incredible streak was one of the great stories in baseball. And it began in mid-September when their coffin was all but nailed shut. Oh, they swings and missiles. Mathematically, they had a shot. But realistically, you know, they were four and a half out with 13 games to play. It just didn't look like they were going to have a shot to get in. Well, the Rockies fall to 76 and 72. That look from Ryan Spielberg sums up these first two days yeah. back at Coors Field. Yeah, the frustration. They can kind of feel it start to slip away. We thought to ourselves, we have to win out if we want to go to the playoffs. And that was the thing. It wasn't like, well, you know, good luck next year. It was, we got to win out. Might as well do it. This one is a Rockies winner, eight in a row. The Rockies have swept the Dodgers. They have won 11 in a row. When you get that many people actually on the same page, 
actually believe in the same thing and see what happens. What happens are the kind of special moments Todd Helton experienced on September 18th when he came up with one on, down by a run against the Dodgers, Takashi Saito. It's one of those games we knew we had to win. I was just trying to concentrate and see the baseball and he had to leave a breaking ball over the plate. It's one run and hit high and deep to right. That's the ball game. Rockies win in the bottom of the ninth. It was, holy cow, you know, we, we can do this. Oh man, they're gonna mop him at the plate. He does a swan dive into his teammates, and I think that moment sort of encapsulated the feeling that was beginning to come over this team that they couldn't lose. Turns out we had to win 13 out of 14 to get in, and we did. But they still faced quite a hurdle, a one-game playoff against Jake Peavy and the Padres. It's hard to explain, you know, the emotions that you go through in that game because you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down. And in the top of the 13th, they were down. Hairston swinging away, sends it out towards deep left field. Back goes Matt Holliday. That ball is up and that ball is gone. A two-run home run for Scott Hairston here in the 13th inning. The Rockies' magical journey seemed about to end. For now, they had to face the all-time saves leader. Next thing you know, you're down two runs in the 13th, and Hoffman's coming on the mound. It's the guy you want out there if you're a San Diego fan. We still believe in our team and believe that you know, we still have three more outs. Game's not over. It ain't over to the fat lady singing. She wasn't singing yet. Bang, bang, bang. There's hit one hit after another, and next thing you know, Holiday scored the winning run. Tagging is Holiday. The throw to the plate. He is safe. The Rockies are the National League wild card winners jumping up and down on the field. Next thing you know, we're flying to Philadelphia. We realize, hey, we're not here just to be here. We're here to win. The Colorado Rockies are headed to the National League Championship Series for the first time in their franchise history. They swept Philadelphia, which was the National League East champion. They swept Arizona, which was the National League West champion. Tulowitzki has it, throws to first. Ball game, World Series time in Colorado. One of the most remarkable stories any baseball team has ever authored in September and into October. The Rockies had to wonder if they'd play Boston, whom they'd met in interleague play back in June. Josh Beckett loses for the first time all year. He worked just five innings, gave up a season-high six runs, a season-high ten hits. It was then that Troy Tulowitzki had a prophecy. We're in Boston in June. Tulo goes and says, we're going to be back here for the World Series. What a play by Tulowitzki. I predicted it, you know, that we'd be back here for the World Series. I saw their team and thought they were the team that was going to come out of the American League. This is in June. I mean, when we beat Boston. The Rockies win the series two games to one. That's when we got up to 500. I saw us heading in the right direction, and uh, what I said was true. Tulowitzki's take notwithstanding, most observers viewed the 2007 pennant winners as very different clubs. There was a vast divide between the national appraisals of these teams, one of them extremely famous and one of them virtually unknown. A lot of people around the country may not know these Colorado Rockies. The Rockies are young, homegrown, energetic. With this run in postseason play, the entire baseball world is going to know about this Colorado club. They don't really have any of your outlandish type guys that are going to be great on the Letterman show or something. Look at those red shoelaces, dude. They're looking good, too low. The Red Sox certainly have more prominent characters. There's no question about that. There's a lot that comes out of Manny and a lot that comes out of David Ortiz that can get people excited. That's what I'm talking about! You can either really hate them or really love them or just enjoy watching their antics, but they've earned the right to have those antics because they've proven themselves in the postseason. The Boston Red Sox are world champions! These Red Sox had nine players with rings, including three World Series MVPs. No Rocky had ever won a fall classic game, not even the face of their franchise. How about Todd Helton playing close to 1,600 games in his major league career before ever getting a taste of the postseason? The way the Rockies are constituted, we're probably at different times in our maturation process. Some of their core players are very young. Including their pitchers, for when three of Colorado's starters went down with injuries, they were pressed to call up some unproven youngsters, 
which made their playoff chances seem even more remote. When you talk about an experienced team versus a young team, it can go two ways. The young team can have the deer in the headlights look, or they can have ignorance is bliss and say, hey, we have nothing to lose. We're the ugly guy in the fight. Experience weighted heavily on the side of the Red Sox. Does that matter? Oh, well, you know, maybe to some degree, but I like talent over experience. The experience, I got to believe it can help, but we didn't have any experience in the division series. We didn't have the experience in the championship series. It was an incredible feat what they accomplished winning 21 out of 22 games heading into World Series. Our focus has been simple. We execute well, we'll have a chance to win. We don't execute well, we put ourselves in position to lose. It was certainly no surprise that these fundamentally sound teams came into the series ranked among the best in both pitching and defense. But now the Rockies had to wait eight long days before playing their first ever fall classic. They've been playing every day for six months and all of a sudden you had a week off. It was like Super Bowl week. You're on a hot streak. You might not want those days off, but you never know. The only way to tell is to go out and play. Our destiny's in our own hands now. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to Fenway Park for Game 1 of the 2007 World Series. It's the Sox against the Rock. Hey, congratulations to you guys, man. Oh, thank you. Cold, damp night here at Fenway Park. Game one of the 103rd World Series. You've got the Boston Red Sox, the fabled Red Sox. Ted Williams, Yastrzemski, and Big Poppy to the current day. They're playing a team in the World Series tonight that didn't exist until 1993. Most fans expected Boston to reach the World Series. Both Sox are back in the big dance yet again. That wasn't the case with the upstart Rockies. America wants to know, who are these Rockies? Why are they here? I didn't want to hit Gene Velasco in the back of the head. I was a little nervous getting too far out here. I got to admit, having covered a lot of World Series, and obviously never with the Rockies, that it was a little bit like a dream sequence. All of it was familiar, except for the visiting team. How did they get here? What are we doing here, Jamie? I do think they felt a little out of place. Do we belong here? Nobody goes here. <laughs> it's a loose band of guys, man. They, it reminds me a lot of covering a college team. How are you going, Ryan Spillers? How are you? Pleasure. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. They're kind of living this dream. What's there to be stressed about? Back, 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 back. It's not how they got there. It's the fact that they're just good guys and they're living a dream. It's time to get ready for the World Series. Let's go. The job of quieting this Boston buzzsaw would first go to Colorado's 17-game winner, Jeff Francis. The Sox countered with a proven postseason performer. Who's on the mound tonight for the Boston Red Sox? This game one. These days, that means it's this guy, Josh Beckett. What do you think? How many games? Four. Four? Four. Yeah. Sweet. Rockies haven't lost since, like, June. Beckett, in this postseason, has been extraordinary. We got Beckett pitching. People are starting to think about him among the best of all time. Big game. Give the ball to Beckett. That's what the Red Sox have done after the Marlins did it back in 2003. The Florida Marlins are world champions. And what an incredible performance by Josh Beckett. 23 innings pitch. He struck out 26. He's only walked one guy in one of the most dominant postseason performers that we've seen. This time there are no ghosts. There are no curses. This is only about baseball. Congratulations. It's been a magical run for the Rockies. It has been a tremendous year for the Red Sox. Game one sets a tone. The Red Sox need the win to squash this team of destiny. So here we go. The Colorado Rockies sending Willie Tavares to the plate. You're facing a team that had won 21 out of 22. Hadn't lost the game in 38 days. Josh set the tone, and he set the tone right from the get-go. Beckett set that tone by forcing the well-rested and possibly rusty Rockies <laughs> to swing at air. He was throwing the mid to upper 90s and blew those guys away and it really did set the tone. Josh's performance was outstanding. Fastball on the outside corner, strike three call. Josh took the ball and was dominant from the outset and began to, to, to cement his place here. Pitch on the way. Swing to the best, he struck it out. He wants to be the best player on the field that day he takes him out. Boy, good running fastball away by Josh Beckett and this Fenway crowd thrilled with their big guy. Beckett to strike out the side and pick up right where he left off in the ALCS. 
But NLCS MVP Matt Holliday stood in his way. Hey there, Matt. That was then. This was now. The two down and two strikes. Fenway Park comes alive. Swing of this, he struck him out. As soon as he struck out those three first guys, we, we knew he was on. And that'll do it for the Rockies. They're out in order, and Beckett fans to side. Everyone's excited, and the place was going crazy. Josh Beckett makes his statement at the beginning of this World Series. When you strike guys out, especially good hitters, it gives you a little extra oomph. As though a team that had scored 30 runs in its last three games needed any oomph. Hey, Dustin. But they got it anyway from Dustin Pedroia. That one is hammered deep to the left center field. That one's way back there. Gone! A home run! A home run for Pedroia leading off the World Series for the Red Sox. Can you believe it? And it is one to nothing, Boston. I try to set the tone for the game, hitting lead off, especially in the, in the playoffs. That first game, I was fortunate enough to get a pitch to, to, that I could handle, and I hit it good, and it, and it snuck out of there. You can't start out any better than that. Three strikeouts by Josh Beckett, and a home run by your leadoff batter. It definitely got us pumped up and ready to go, and I think that just kind of correlated how everything ended up playing out. It worked out great. Boston looked ready to rumble, led by the championship series hits leader, Kevin Euclid. That's in the right center field and to the wall. And a base hit left field to Boston. And a line drive, base hit left field. And he stops at second. And J.D. drew a bead on Francis. Swing, line drive, base hit down the right field line. One run will score Ramirez. And it's three to nothing, Red Sox in the first. We scored three runs in the first inning. It's a huge start to our World Series. Josh Beckett dominating in the first three nothing, Red Sox on to the second. Where Beckett continued to deal. Baseball struck him out swinging. And he was really late on that fastball. Four batters, four strikeouts. The steady rain at Fenway didn't make it any easier to pick up Beckett's pitches. But just when Josh was about to tie the record for most consecutive strikeouts to start a World Series with five, up came Garrett Atkins. Atkins goes deep into left field. Ramirez will watch it get off the very top of the green monster. Double for Garrett Atkins. The Rockies will need a two-out hit from their rookie shortstop, Troy Tulowitzki. As Tulowitzki shoots the gap in left center, the Rockies are on the board. It's an RBI double for Troy Tulowitzki, and the Rockies get one back. It's now a 3-1 to one ball game. Now Colorado needed Francis to hold Boston at bay, and the inning did start out that way. A good second inning for Francis. The strikeout, a ground out, and he has Euclid's 0-2. But Boston led the majors in pitches per plate appearance, and Euclid embodied that patience. They're not going to swing at the pitcher's pitch. They're fine letting strike one go by them. Even strike two, it seems like you get them 0-2, they don't feel like they're in a hole. Down and away, the first walk of the night. Got ahead of Euclid and walked it. Red Sox fans have seen this now for, for several years. They're grinding out every single at bat. If they can foul off your pitches as much as they need to and wait for you to leave the ball over the middle of the plate, then they're not gonna miss it. One, two to Ortiz is lying in left. Holiday will let it go all the way to the wall. The first, coming to the plate, it's 4-1. You're not going to swing at balls, but you're going to swing at strikes. That's being patient and aggressive at the same time, and that's what we are. As the game moved into the fourth, the Red Sox continued to methodically chip away at Francis. The opposite way, another hit for Ortiz. There's no starting pitcher that can get through this line at three times in a row on a consistent basis, and, and it just steamrolled. And Manny lasers one into the alley in right center field. That'll get down and roll toward the warning track. Francis with 95 pitches. He's not yet through the fourth. So this will be the 99th pitch of the game thrown by Francis. Swing right, right down the left field line. It's a fair ball. One run is in, two runs are in. Boston now leading 6-1. to one. And that's the strategy. The strategy is get that starting pitcher out of the game as quickly as possible and get into the soft underbelly of another team's bullpen. And when they got there in the fifth, the Red Sox exploded for seven two-out runs. They get on a roll, they are relentless. His teammates had given Beckett a double-digit lead, but he still pitched as though he were only up by one. Baseball struck him out swinging. Yeah, he doesn't have a chance on that. 
pitch. Deals through pitch in the way. Fastball swung at it and missed. He got him. 94 miles per hour in that here. He's testing to see if Colorado can catch up with the fastball after the layoff. Well, they had a long layoff. We were trying to maybe speed up some of their bats, get them a little bit fidgety because they hadn't played for a while. And I think he did a very good job of that. The layoff might be a factor, but with the way Josh Beckett is pitched in the postseason, how can you tell? Seven strikeouts. Eight strikeouts. Strikeout number nine for Beckett. Beckett has just been sensational. Devastated. Invincible. Give me another word. How about clutch? For Beckett's career postseason ERA now stood at a staggering 1.73, putting him behind just Mariano Rivera and Christy Mathewson among pitchers with 70 postseason innings. The 12-run margin made this the most lopsided Game 1 in World Series history, and the Red Sox became the first team ever to score 10 or more runs in three consecutive postseason games. Their 13 runs also set a Game 1 World Series record, and 11 of them came with two out. The Red Sox lead the 2007 World Series one game to none. Tonight at Fenway, all Boston. The Red Sox 13, the Rockies 1. We just jumped on top early, and I think that was the biggest thing for us to score runs early and, and often. And this whole team from 1 through 9 and playing defense and pitching did an unbelievable job tonight. And from the Rockies, the best thing about this game was that it ended. But that's not the way we drew it up. You know what? We'll get back out there and get after it tomorrow. had changed in Boston for game two of the series. Confidence had not. Program scorecard and lineup. All the names, all the numbers. Let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Down. Nice job. Go, Sox. Woo! We're at Fenway Park, game two of the World Series. The Rockies and the Boston Red Sox. I'm like, up. Don't say anything stupid. What do you got? You're gonna gangster suit. Did you see my Did suit? you see my tie? No. I went light pink suit? tie. Yeah, that's suit. Where'd you get that at? One of these days, you, you can be on my level. <laughs> It'll be Kurt Schilling for the Red Sox, who's already won 10 postseason games in his illustrious career. And a rookie, Ovaldo Jimenez, whom the Red Sox haven't seen before, pitching for the Colorado Rockies. The contrast was startling. This would be Schilling's 19th postseason start in 20 seasons of big league baseball. Meanwhile, the Rockies Ubaldo Jimenez was just a rookie and now was being asked to tame the most torrid lineup in the game. 11 runs last night with, with two outs. That has not been a theme that, that we've, uh, you know, we've had a lot of during the season. We wouldn't be here. So that being said, Ubaldo's our man tonight. With 10 postseason wins already to his credit, Kurt appeared to have the upper hand on the young Rockies, but they touched him early on. First up for the Rockies, Willie Tavares. The Rockies won a strike early. The one-two pitch, high fastball, high and tight, and that hit him. Up came Holiday with one out and Tavares on first. The pitch with the runner going, swinging the ground ball, off the glove with the diving low, rolls into foul ground. Here's Tavares to third, nobody's covering in time. Pro gets away, and down to second goes Holiday. Now the Rockies putting early pressure on just what they wanted to do. A 2-1 to help. To the right side, that'll put Colorado on top. In the glare of the fall classic, Jimenez showed some poise. This young man is only 23. Herky jerky type motion, hides the ball well and throws very hard. I just kept thinking about like throw a strike, just challenge the hitters, get him up. It's a perfect first inning for Jimenez. Exactly what the Rockies needed. For a first year player up here, pitching in this venue, against this ball club, he gave us everything he had. Colorado had its first and what would be its only lead of the series. And as the game unfolded, both pitchers settled into a groove. The splitters struck him out swinging. Fastball, strike three called. And now the one-two to Matsui. Fastball, call strike three. Yeah! But in the bottom of the third, Jimenez ran into trouble with the oh-so-patient Red Sox. 
First a two-out walk to Pedroia, then Euclid, and up came David Ortiz. A swing and a blast out toward right. Hop chasing toward the corner, toward the foul pole, and it is just foul! Big Poppy's near miss of that pesky little pole could have rattled Ubaldo, but it didn't. It's not a sequence of things that he has to get done. You're just one quality pitch away from being back in the dugout. And Jimenez would make that necessary pitch. Yeah. Ortiz went around. Big strikeout for Jimenez, his second of the night. Still, the Red Sox looked for an opening and found one in the fourth when a walk set the stage for a suddenly resurgent J.D. Drew. Now Drew, left-handed batter, and he drives one, based it into right field. Hop racing over to pick it up on his way to third is Lowell. Here comes the throw. It's a strong one, the slide, and he's just in with a hit first grab of the bag. Some aggressive base running by the Red Sox, down one nothing. Now they've got two men in scoring position. Second and third, one out for Veritek, who with a hit could give the Red Sox the lead. Backs into center field. Back is Tavares. Tying on will score. That's Lowell. Over to third goes Drew. It's 1-1 one -one here in the fourth. 14 years ago, Kurt Schilling won his first World Series game. Now he could become just the second pitcher after Jim Palmer to get fall classic wins that far apart. Check of the runner again, the 0-2, and it's strike three called over the inside corner with a fastball. The legend grows for Kurt Schilling. It's a good feeling when he pitches. Uh, whatever the situation, you know he's going to be prepared for it. The rhythm of this game was vastly different from the first. But one thing hadn't changed. Boston's penchant for two-out rallies. 3-2 to Ortiz with two out is inside for ball four. And Manny Ramirez with that. Hard hit. Base hit. And it's first and second two out here in the fifth inning for the Red Sox. And as Boston fans had discovered throughout the season, there was no one better to be up in this situation than Mike Lowell. World Series tied at one in the fifth inning. Two on, two out. Batter is Mikey Lowell. He's really evolved into uh, the team leader. Line drive and a left and put Boston out in front. Mike Lowell has delivered. His professionalism uh, is probably uh, the gold standard on this club. A double from Mike Lowell, and Boston has gone ahead 2-1. to one. You know, I think that's the pitch I was waiting for, something where I can, you know, get my arms extended, put some good wood on it, and it, and it worked out nice. It turned out to be a big run for us. With Boston up 2-1 to one in the sixth, Schilling left the game, hoping that the Red Sox bullpen would help him secure his third victory of this postseason. And with Hideki Okajima right behind him, why not? He could be called by many as our most valuable pitcher. Hockey's are set up here where a base hit could put them ahead. He has been unbelievable, Hideki Okajima. Without Oki, we don't get where we ended up. 2-2 two -two pitch. Fastball, strike three call to the inside corner. He doesn't throw a dominating fastball, but he was able to be a dominating pitcher. Okajima sets the lefty throws. Fastball, strike three, call in the inside corner. It, there's no way we will without him. Okajima ready, facing his countryman. Taz swing In that situation, I could not allow any runs. It was that crucial. Therefore, I am glad that I was able to perform the way I could. Okajima gave way to Papelbon with two out in the eighth and Boston still leading by one. Jonathan would face the dangerous Matt Holliday, who already had three hits in the game. Oh, a two to Matt Holliday. I had Holiday 0-2 there, obviously, and then I, was, I gave up the hit. It is a base hit for Matt Holliday. Matt represented the tying run, especially if he could get to second. He also knew that Papelbon rarely threw to first, and that proved to be his downfall. You know, I think he was trying to creep out on me and get a lead to maybe take second to put himself in scoring position with two outs. Go to first, and he got it picked off! He's out! Papelbon picks off Holiday to win the eighth inning! Can 
Can you believe it? You know, that kind of, I think, happened to be the turning point of the game. And with Papelbon out there in the ninth, the Rockies had nowhere else to turn. One strike away, Papelbon throws. He struck it out with a high fastball. The Red Sox lead the 2007 World Series two games to none as Jonathan Papelbon saves this 2-1 to victory for Boston. The Red Sox bullpen was exceptional once again, and no one appreciated it more. Than Chile. This was the, the Papajima show tonight. That was just phenomenal to watch. We had to have it, and they both answered the bell. Two more. For the first time in their 15-year history, the Rockies were hosting a World Series game, and Denver was ready to rock. Rockies! Rock their socks off! What a charged up atmosphere here in Denver as this city and this ballpark prepares to host its first ever World Series game. This is one of the biggest events in Denver, okay, so the, the people here are going to be involved. This entire city is a buzz. This ballpark is electric. I'm happy for the city. They've waited a long time to finally get to experience you know, a World Series game in Denver. Too legit! Too legit to the fans now, it's crazy. I mean, you see grown men walking around wearing purple wigs. So it's been somewhat loud tonight, huh? Yeah, it's going to be great. It'll be fun. Game three of the 2007 World Series. The Red Sox lead the series two games tonight. Game three is on the way. Fresh off his victory in Game 7 of the ALCS, Dice K became the first Japanese pitcher to start a World Series game. He's a dynamic talent who has uh, taken on a new challenge, so it's understandable that there'd be a lot of attention. What a huge event. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, Tokyo time. He'd be facing Josh Fogg, also making his first Fall Classic start, and whose clutch pitching thus far had earned him a heroic nickname. Given the term uh, Dragon Slayer by Matt Holliday, his teammates, well, I'll tell you, he's facing a fire-breathing dragon tonight. That would be the red-hot Boston lineup, which had scored 45 runs in its last five games. They're really good offensive ball club. They don't chase bad pitchers at all. I mean, and then they basically just waiting for us, you know, to make a mistake. The game was scoreless through two, before the rookies Pedroia and Ellsbury the latter making his fifth straight start, kicked off what would be a night they would never forget. Line drive, fair down the left field line. Ellsbury will hustle in towards second base. The throw, the slide, safe. Ellsbury is two for two tonight, and the Red Sox have the leadoff man in scoring position. Pedroia drops a bunt down in front of the plate. Torrey Alba throws high to first, pulls Helton off the bag, and Pedroia is going to be safe. Dustin and I, you know, we realized that we have to get on base for uh, the guys behind us. With no designated hitter, David Ortiz got the start at first, replacing the better fielding Kevin Euclid, who had a front row seat to watch what Big Poppy does best. And he rips one into the corner. Ellsbury can walk home as Ortiz pulls into second base with a double. The Red Sox lead it one to nothing. Colorado elected to walk Ramirez intentionally choosing instead to face the man who led the Sox with 120 RBI and who was now chomping at the bit. Anyone would like to hit with the bases loaded and no outs. You know, that's a, that's a time where we can really do something good. Swing of the ground ball right up the middle. Pedroia's in the score. Here comes Ortiz around third, and he scores. It's a two-run single for Lowell, and it is 3-0 Boston. Two big runs for us, and very satisfying. After walking someone intentionally for you to come through for the team is something that you, you feel real good about. But there was more as Dice K became just the sixth Boston pitcher ever with a World Series RBI. In the left field, a base hit for Dice K. One run is in, the way Veritek towards the plate. He'll score, and the Red Sox lead it five to nothing. We'll take RBIs from anybody. I don't know that you can count on that coming into a game. I mean, he said he was a good hitter. His first hit in the big leagues, a two-run single in game three of the World Series to give Boston a five-nothing lead. 
flipped the Red Sox bat around, and Jacoby Ellsbury, the rookie who started this with a double, will dig in with first and third, two out. Leading off the game, I was just trying to see some pitches, and then it'll set me up for my future ABs, and I can be a little bit more aggressive later on in the game. Line drive out toward left center field, coming on Sullivan, dives, can't get it, and rolls by him. In to score Lugo, in to second with his second hit in the inning, his third hit of the night, Jacoby Ellsbury, and the Red Sox continue to pile it on. It's now a 6-0 Boston lead. With a six-run margin, Dice K assumed command, proving that his game was just as good as his height. Swing and a miss, he got him with a good fastball away. He pitched very well. Um, I think one of the reasons why he was successful, he was pitching off his fastball and uh, later on mixing up his, his off-speed pitches. Breaking ball for strike three. How good has Dice K. Matsuzaka been tonight, huh? You talk about a guy who's pitching with a world of confidence. But come the sixth, things got just a little dicey. A four-pitch walk, and with a six-run lead, he has walked two in a row. And with Hop coming up, Francona is going to go to the mound. Matsuzaka's night was over, and the Rockies seized the moment. Two on, one out, pop at the plate. Brad loops it into left center field. That's going to drop for a hit. Hilton rounds third. He will score, and the Rockies are on the board. Hop brought the Colorado crowd back to life as the Rockies appeared to be mounting one of their fabled rallies. Torrey Alba grounds a base hit in the left. Atkins to the plate. It's a four-run game. Was kind of excited, you know, finally see uh, our team, you know, start to get some offering going uh, um, and get the crowd excited. Finally, something for this big crowd to cheer about. We're down 6 nothing. They're still on their feet, you know, and they feel like the momentum's starting to shift. Rockies have jumped back in it. In comes Mike Timlin. Spillboards will be the hitter. And Ryan came within a foot of fulfilling some mile-high hopes. Slugged out to center, back goes Ellsbury, track, wall, got it, right at the wall, 415 feet away from the plate. And all of Red Sox nation can exhale, wow. Having come up short on a long drive, the Rockies tried a line drive, but Boston's defense is one of the best. Line drive, caught by the shortstop, Lugo with the leaping grab, and the inning is over. They come up there and they're expecting it to be a hit and they think that they're going to start getting a little bit of momentum going and then bam, we take that momentum away from them in the field. So two very loud outs, but Timlin escapes the jam. Still, the resilient Rockies continued to fight back. And in the seventh, Matt Holliday came up with two on and nobody out. Clint Hurdle's team has got to get something out of this opportunity. He's just a guy who understands the game, who understands his abilities. And this guy is one of the best young players to come along in a while. The Red Sox countered with Hideki Okajima, unhittable in his Game 2 appearance. Holiday sought to change that. He was the best clutch hitter the Rockies had all year. And his home runs were, as Clint Hurdle called them, they were light tower home runs. And here is Okajima, who has not allowed a run in this postseason. Nobody out. What? Field! away! What? Field away! It's gone! The three-run homer! And it's a one-run game! That's why he's a special player, because he can have that big hit. You feared it was only a matter of time before this Colorado offense got going. Once Matt hit that home run, we felt like we had some momentum. And what was once a six-run Red Sox advantage has now been sliced to a single run. We felt if we shut him down, we were going to come back in and score. We were confident. Holiday's blast had lit the Rockies' fire, but Okajima snuffed it out. Swing and a miss, he struck it out with a change shot. He's the type of guy that doesn't let one hit or a home run here or there, you know, bother him. And he keeps pumping strikes. Okajima just continues to battle. Hideki managed to keep it a one-run game. His effort was rewarded in the eighth. And Ellsbury, once again, was the key. 
Two men on and one man out for Jacoby Ellsbury. My first three at bats, they were pitching me away and they brought in the lefty and I figured that they were gonna try to come in on me. And a high fly ball to right field toward the line. Long run for Hockey. Dives, he can't get it. It rolls away. Here comes Lugo to score. Crisp to third. Ellsbury to second with his third double of the game. And the Red Sox lead it seven to five. Jacoby Ellsbury becomes the third rookie in World Series history with four hits in a game. He plays with a lot of confidence and he's aware of the situations around him, so it's not just acting like he's confident. He should be confident. He's a good player, and he knows how to play the game. What a difference he has made in the lineup for the Boston Red Sox. And Pedroia continued Boston's relentless one-two punch. Line drive right field down the line. It gets down for a base hit and a score two. Pedroia dives safely with a double. This kid is going to be a winner for a long time because that's just the way he plays the game. I've worked real hard my whole life. You just go out there, play as hard as you can, and, uh, you know, hopefully you win. And the Red Sox now lead it 9-5. to five. It was a big momentum swing, and I uh, took the crowd out of it a little bit. What a game by Ellsbury and Pedroia. They set the table as well as you could ever want. They're 7 for 10 with four RBIs. They've been doing a fantastic job at the top of the order. we got to find a way to slow them down. Baseball's biggest stage, they have performed. And so it came down to Papelbon. Ninth inning, five run lead. You do the math. Swain a broken back, grounded to short. Lugo has it, wings it across, and the Red Sox lead the World Series three wins to none as they beat the Colorado Rockies in game three, 10 to five. You're in as good a situation as you could be in, up three games to none. But uh, Colorado is a great ball club, and uh, they're going to compete just uh, just like you saw tonight. It's going to be tough to get that fourth one. We're okay. We're we coming back. We're coming back. Boston coming was 3-0. Now we're 3-0. We're all about winning game four. That's the only thing that's going on as far as baseball talk. Go play a game and play to win. Okay. The Boston Red Sox are one game away from winning the World Championship. on the clubhouse inside. Jack, the Rockies have had their backs up against the wall many times this year, none more so than right now. The Red Sox just one win away from a championship. 2007 Red Sox going for a sweep with the Colorado Rockies as the Red Sox try to become the first team to win two world championships in the 21st century. It is game four of the World Series from Coors Field in Denver. And it featured a unique matchup. Two well-rested pitchers, each with an inspirational story to tell. And tonight it all starts with the starting pitchers, both of whom are coming in after extended periods of rest. Rocky starter Aaron Cook has not pitched since August the 10th because of a left oblique strain. John Lester tonight making his third postseason appearance. So the first two, though, both in relief. He hasn't made a start since September the 26th, more than a month ago. So we'll see how the long layoff affects these two pitchers. Aaron Cook in 2004 had blood clots in his lung. They say he could have died on the mound. He came back from that after surgery, and for John Lester, Don Hodgkin's lymphoma a year ago, chemotherapy, he's back from that. So two guys just thrilled to be here. You just don't think they're going to be scared after what they've been through. The first inning may tell a lot of the tale for both of these pitchers. I don't know if anybody can predict what we're about to see from this right hand. In the top of the first, the young star of game three continued his assault on Rocky's pitching. And a leadoff double for Jacoby Ellsbury to start the night. And this is where we left off yesterday, isn't it? That's five base hits. He's had his last six and back. It's also his fourth double in the World Series. Just uh, trying to put the bat on the ball. I think that's the biggest thing for me, U utilizing my speed. When I when I put the ball in play, um, can create havoc at, at times. And... Here's Dustin Pedroia now trying to move Ellsbury up. Pedroia grounds to third. Ellsbury takes third. One away. Good base running by the rookie, Jacoby Ellsbury. That's part of my game is, uh, you know, being aggressive on the base path. You know, I know as, as a defensive player, when you have a guy on the bases, it, it puts a little stress on, on the defense. Watch Ellsbury, excellent base running, realizing that at 
Hopkins was playing in third base is not covered by anyone in Ellsbury. Very nice base running, and Pedroia does the job. So now a runner in third, and David Ortiz steps in. Poppy four for 12, three RBIs in the World Series. Infield in in the first inning. And even the big man can play small ball. There's a ground ball. Right side through for a base hit. Ortiz strikes, and the Red Sox lead it one to nothing. They're playing good baseball. I mean, you can't take anything away from the Red Sox, how well they're playing. They're getting hits every single time. Right through the hole between first and second, and just like that, the Boston Red Sox have a one to nothing lead. The Red Sox were looking for their fourth straight series victory from a starting pitcher, and Lester appeared up to the task. We had a lot of breathing room going into that game. And uh, I think that just made me feel that much more comfortable. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. Swing and a ground ball. Droyda was left. A quick inning for John Lester. Three up and three down. The game had all the makings of a classic pitching duel, as Aaron Cook also rose to the occasion. Aaron Cook is a guy that they look to because anytime he takes the mound, he can mow down the opposition. After allowing a run in the first inning, he's trying to pitch a perfect second. And with the help of Matt Sui, he does. Three up and three down. And we head to the last of the second. Lester was aware that the Rockies could explode at any time. They've got a very powerful lineup. You get through Holiday and Helton and Atkins, and you think you can take a break, but you really can't. You got guys at the top and the bottom that, that can hurt you. But even the best offense can be picked off by great defense. So much for the guy can't play first base. He made it look easy. The inning is over. A leadoff double for the Rockies, but they do not get a run. Two men stranded onto the third. Eric Cook is pitching well. Bottom of the third inning, game four. He's the guy who went out there tonight, without a doubt. He's got no fear. He says, here's my sinker. Hit it. And uh, odds are you're going to hit it in that thick grass we have, and it's going to be a ground ball. Seven in a row retired by... Cook, six of them on ground ball. Second consecutive one, two, three inning for Aaron Cook as he dispenses of the Red Sox very quickly. But Lester answered back in the bottom of the third with two big strikeouts. Swing and a miss, he tied him up in on the hands. And John Lester with that cutter moving in, able to fan Tulowitzki. You know, early on in the game and just getting in a rhythm and trying to get outs early. Swing and a miss and a high fastball, he got him. And John Lester strands Matsui at second, striking out to Lewitsky and Holiday, two of the Rockies' biggest bats in succession to put out the fire. Cook kept pace in the fourth. No matter what the situation, he's always one pitch away from getting out of an inning. Line drive into left, Holiday is there, and how about Aaron Cook? And it's another one, two, three, and the third in a row for Aaron Cook. John Lester, a pitcher's duel in game four, one to nothing, Red Sox on top. Then in the fifth, Mike Lowell once again gave his team the chance to pounce. And a shot into left center field off the bat of Lowell. Bustling over his holiday, then he drops it. And Mike Lowell is in the second with a double. And that opened the door for Jason Veritek. Got to see a lot of pitches and work them a little bit. My first at bat, I just happened to look for something in that next at bat that I could drive or pull. I ended up getting a pitch and was able to, to sneak it through enough to, to allow Mikey to score from second. The hammer through the hole for a base hit. Lowe will come to the plate. The throw home by Hop. He's got a good arm. Safe! Great slide by Lowe. He went to the back of the plate with a hand. The Red Sox lead it 2 to nothing. After allowing just three hits, Lester left the biggest game of his baseball life in the sixth. His comeback was truly heroic. You know, we tried to downplay his situation because we were competing. He came out and competed. He didn't get tired. He kept his stamina. Uh, he threw strikes. He, he, did a, he did a great job. We were proud of him. John Lester does a heck of a job in his World Series debut here tonight, getting into the sixth inning with a 2 0 lead. Once it was over, it was hard not to downplay it because it was significant. It meant a lot. As someone who suffered at one point from the same disease that John Lester had, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I think it set an example uh, and a message to a lot of people in the uh, cancer community. It was even more important than winning. It can be stated a storybook ending to not only a personal journey, but a very successful year for our organization. Lester was sensational here tonight. But would John get the victory? Well, he would if Mike Lowell had anything to say about it. You know, he had a good sinker going, but he was coming in on me, uh, especially. Now, the first pitch was a sinker in for a ball, 
And uh, I said, well, if he comes back with that pitch, I just wanted to really be able to stay direct and stay inside that ball. And it was exactly that. Uh, I looked for it, got it, and uh, I knew I hit it well. Roll, hits one into left field. But when you're running, you're kind of looking, looking, and then once you, once I saw Holiday turn his back and, and hit the stands, was a uh, was a great feeling. Goodbye, Wall goes deep. The man who may be the MVP of this series, he touches them all at Coors Field. And it'll be the end of the night for Aaron Cook, tip of the cap to the crowd. And here in the seventh inning of Game Four, the Rockies trail three nothing. The Rockies were down but far from out, as Brad Hopp got the best of the Boston bullpen to give Colorado life in the bottom half. But Bobby Kielty answered back. Bobby's a tough kid. I think everybody recognizes that in our clubhouse. First couple days over here, made a catch, hit at the wall. Welcome to the Red Sox. Bobby Kielty able to make the grab. Knocked his back all in a whack, never said a word. I think that was probably the epitome of being ready. Have him play for a week, come up, swing at the first pitch, and hit a ball out of sight. Kelty comes off the bench and hits one for a home run. And the interesting thing is when the Red Sox got him, it was because he hits left-handers very well. Well, here he goes, he's in the World Series, he's got his first crack at, you know, doing something. Bang, home run from the right side of the plate. I mean, it was just perfect, you know, it's the way it was designed when they got him. So it's small things like that that during the season don't really go noticed, but they do go noticed big time when you get to the playoffs. Bobby Kelty hits the 21st pinch hit home run in World Series history. Bobby comes up in a situation, gives us a, an add-on run, and you never know what's going to be enough. And just like that, the Rockies on one pitch give the run back. And it's 4-1 to one in the eighth. But for the second straight game, Okajima struggled. And the Rockies, led by Helton, got to him in the bottom of the eighth. Rockies with one out, have a runner aboard for Garrett Atkins. There's a shot. He fell out way back there. Goodbye. A two-run homer for Garrett Atkins. And now this is a one-run game. Here come the Rockies. They're knocking on the door in the eighth. And Terry Francona is going to go to the bullpen. And Jonathan Tacklebaum, the outstanding Boston closer, enters the game needing five outs more, but now with just a one-run lead. Papelbon did escape the eighth, and now looked to get the three outs that would give Boston the title. It was unbelievable. Bullpen did an outstanding job. They've been there, you know, for the starters all year long. And a ground ball to second base. Pedroia has it cleanly. Fires to first. One out in the ninth inning. And the Red Sox are two outs away. You know what? You don't have a chance to sit back and let your emotions get ahead of you with a one-run game and Jamie Carroll hit a ball to the very furthest point of left field. Swing, there's a shot deep to left field. Going back Ellsbury at the wall. He jumps and he makes the catch. You know, my heart was in my throat for a minute. He got it. Two men down in the ninth inning right up against the wall. Ellsbury pulls it down. Wow. I just wanted the game to be over with. It was it was too crazy. The nerves were getting entirely too high. And then we're looking to see, because they made some switches and they have the pitcher coming up, you know, we wanted to see who was going to hit. And for the Rockies, their final hope is the 25-year-old Seth Smith. He's had some big hits for them in the postseason, and he was a guy that actually we were very cautiously aware of him coming off the bench. Two out, ninth inning. The Rockies are down to their last strike. The Red Sox are one strike away from winning the World Series. Jonathan had envisioned this moment since he was a kid. Being on the mound, making the last out, is definitely something you dream about. The 2-2 two -two pitch. Game over, series over, and the Red Sox are world champs again. It's over. The Red Sox have swept the Colorado Rockies. The Red Sox are the world champions of baseball for 2007. It was just uh, another um, amazing feeling that finally we got it done. The World Championship of Major League Baseball once again belongs to Red Sox Nation. People say it's never the same as the first time. It wasn't the same. It, it was a little bit different feeling, but just as sweet. For the second time in the last four years, the Red Sox have won it all. And the Boston Red Sox become the first team in the 21st century to win two World Series titles. Uh, it was complete release, elation, just pure joy. The Red Sox are World Series champions. Wow. And the Boston Red Sox have won the World Series for the second time in the last four years. In 2007, they had done it again. 
leaving a baseball empire in their wake. Red Sox win the division. Yankees are the wild card. Soaring higher than any angel. Deep into the night, three-run walk-off home run, Manny Ramirez. Crafting still another incredible comeback. Grand slam, J.D. Drew. The Red Sox have won the American League pennant. What an incredible comeback to come back from three games to one. And stopping a team on a historic winning streak, dead in their tracks. Swept the Colorado Rockies. There can be no question that the Boston Red Sox are the best team in Major League Baseball. When you see him swing and miss, it's just this feeling of complete joy. You want to sprint as fast as you can into that pile. It's the joy that comes from winning as a team. to look around and see the faces of all the people who had dedicated so much of their lives to make it happen, from the players to Tito, the coaching staff, ownership. That's the most rewarding feeling. Great job, man. Great job. Yeah! World champ! Woo! It's kind of weird because you're on a very public stage, but it can be a very personal moment. It's amazing how you can be in the middle of a baseball field and feel like you're all alone. Guided by a skipper who never altered his course, the Red Sox reigned supreme. On behalf of Major League Baseball, congratulations. You've had a magnificent season, and I congratulate you and uh, enjoy it. It showed that this wasn't a fluke, that the organization wasn't uh, a bunch of stat geeks who got lucky one year in 2004. This is really an organization that has to be reckoned with. The 04 and the 07 World Series, they are two flavors of ice cream. They're both good, but they both taste different. The 2004 World Series was a once in a century experience. And we've now honored our grandparents and our parents. It's now time to appreciate for ourselves and for our children. This really was for the present generation of Red Sox fans who had come out this year and saw the, the remarkable play of the uh, team this year. And perhaps the most remarkable of all, series MVP, Mike Lowell. The MVP is something I, I never even imagined because there's so many guys that I don't even have the opportunity to be in the World Series. So first is getting there, second is winning, and the MVP for me was just this extra bonus. On behalf of baseball and Chevrolet, congratulations, most valuable player in the 2007 World Series. You couldn't ask for anything better because he was our MVP all throughout the year. And to continue the production and how much he's meant to our lineup and defensively in the clubhouse, you know, Mike's just a, he's a great baseball player. He's a great teammate, too. And with no more games to be won, it was time to have fun. It's body time. Oh, it's on. It's on now. This is what it's all about. Man. celebration lasted into the night and continued back home in an adoring Red Sox nation. We saw our, our players, the emotions come out. Now we'll get to see the fans and it can get intermixed with the players and it's really special. Our fans, they live and die every pitch and there's no doubt about that. And I think that whenever we lose, they feel like they've lost. And whenever we win, they feel like they've won too. And when we go out there and celebrate, they celebrate with us. Boston Red Sox fans really made this team what it is today. You know, Red Sox nation is very special. This is nationwide. They got, there's something special about this organization, about this team, and about the Red Sox spirit. It's great to know that you have fans that really support you and love you and, and really care about you. This day is for everybody. It's been so much fun all year long.
you know, we've seen the passion, but for them to come out, I mean, a lot of people have work, you know, their students have school, and it's not even an option. They're coming out here to, to cheer us on and to show their thanks for what we've done. And so, the 2007 Red Sox are champions. We know we have the best team in baseball. Period. This isn't your dad's Red Sox. This is a new tradition we're starting. We want to put in place beliefs that there is no mountain too high to climb, no hurdle too high to jump. It's just a feeling of total satisfaction from something you set out to do in spring training, and we have to give a lot of credit to a lot of guys. You know, Papa Bond was great. Josh Beckett was outstanding. We played great team defense. So I think there's a lot of MVPs on our team. You put so much hard work into this game, and you take so much time away from your family. And when I put all that hard work in and I get the results, I, I can't even really explain it. I get those feelings, and you feel like your work has paid off. It was just uh, another am amazing feeling that finally we got it done.